Yeah, thank you. Well, um, I'm going to play this off as that this was all on purpose to highlight a point that we're going to make later in the presentation about the challenges of controlled and building systems and microgrids. So it was intentional, intentional. Um, okay, so my name is Karina Hirschberg. I'm a senior associate with PAE. I'm an electrical engineer, um, but I uh, have, after many, many years in the design world, I shifted my career um, to move into the modeling and analysis world. And so I am one of the regional leaders for our regenerative design team, which is our uh, modeling analysis and research group. Um, then I also lead our renewable energy systems practice, which includes microgrids that we'll be talking about today. Yeah, and I'm uh, Mike Dimmel. I'm an, also an electrical senior associate. Um, I'm a lead engineer on projects, project manager on uh, at least a couple of projects that have had microgrids go through to construction and um, electrical engineer of record on, on multiple projects as well. Yeah. All right, so just a little bit about PAE. Hopefully we've had a chance to work with all of you, but in case we haven't, um, so we're an uh, engineering design firm. We're uh, located predominantly on the West Coast, um, offices in uh, Washington, Oregon, and California. Uh, but we work all around um, the country and around the world. Our specialty is in kind of that, the really kind of deep green, innovative, sort of forward-looking um, green building design. And so we've had a chance to work on um, projects uh, around that um, in many locations, which has been wonderful. Um, and we say our vision, um, our, our goal is to help solve the planet's energy and water challenges. Not, not an insignificant uh, undertaking, but a, a deeply important one. And so that's what we'll be talking about today is related to that. Um, and we also believe that that needs to be done in a kind of equitable and just manner. We're both just and uh, be Corp certified, um, which is something that we're really proud of that we're able to participate in both those programs and are able to provide the transparency and, and industry advocacy through that. All right, uh, so this is obviously AIA sessions. We've got our learning objectives. We talk about the microgrids, but again, it's really in the context of, of energy decarbonization and building decarbonization is um, the focus of what we're, we're really looking at today. Um, and then sign up forms, we have online one, I don't know if you somewhere, there's, okay. <laughs> And All right. When we get a chance, can we hide uh, the participant video? Oh. Yes. Taking a risk. Close enough. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Okay. All right. So today we're going to be starting off talking about grid interactive buildings, then we'll move to resiliency, microgrids, and then we'll finish up with some, with some case studies. Um, and the reason we're hitting so many topics, and I will say we have jam-packed a lot into this session. Um, those are actually three <laughs> totally one hour independent sessions that we normally get, but it's, they're all deeply, deeply integrated. And so, so we've kind of mashed up in, into here. Um, so we'll have hopefully some time for Q&A at the end. But the reason we have them all kind of pulling together is they're all sort of forming around this idea of microgrids. And the reason why microgrids are becoming such a hot topic in kind of the world, not just our industry, but sort of in the world in general right now, is that they sit at this sort of unique intersection between sustainability and resiliency in terms of the energy world. Um, and so we'll be looking at kind of the both perspectives of that in terms of the built environment and then what does it mean for projects. So we're going to start with the grid interactive buildings, which is the sustainability side of um, that graph there. And it this kind of gets into, you know, to what you said is of carbon, right? Is this realization that we have the problem of our lives to solve, which is the climate crisis and getting into the fact that we have um, an excess of greenhouse gas emissions being released, right? And so the problem that we're trying to solve is emissions or carbon. Our industry, though, has always talked of it in terms of energy, right? We've used energy as a, the metric, as a proxy for emissions. And the reason for that is that it's way easier to quantify energy than it is emissions, right? You get your energy bill from your utilities. You can meter it. You can measure it. It's a, this is known entity. Emissions is not. It's much more esoteric. It's a lot harder to quantify. And so using energy as that proxy worked really well 
um, for a long time. And it really helped our industry advance, right? Net zero energy as a goal really helped launch us into thinking differently about our relationship with energy and our buildings and how our buildings operated. But the problem is, is because we were solving for energy, um, using, you know, solving for energy, but actually trying to solve for emissions, we've reached a point now in building operations where that disconnect in the metric we're using is starting to cause a problem. We are missing um, some of the knobs that we need to turn because we're looking at kind of the wrong metric. And so that's what we're, we're moving to now is, is thinking about directly getting back into the missions. And the reason that this started to fall apart is that again, energy was very easy to quantify. And what we would do is we say, okay, we know what our annual energy use is. We can convert that into our emissions impact. And if we know what our emissions impact is, we started off doing that as an annual, you know, single number. And we looked at for electricity, for example, we just said, well, we know what electricity, the emissions associated with the, you know, one unit of electricity is this many emissions. So if we use this many units, times it by that, now we know what our emissions. Um, the problem is that that's not actually how the grids work. And we'll talk specifically on electricity today. It's even more complicated when we get into natural gas, but today, obviously with the electrification movement, that's what we're focusing on. Um, the grids are way more complex. There's a lot more that's going on, right? And so that was kind of the introduction of the e-grid, if you're familiar with that approach, right? That we acknowledge that there is a locational difference in what is that, again, that what is that emissions factor of that single electron? So, well, depends on where you're at, right? If you're up in the Northwest, we have a lot of existing hydro. So our emissions associated with our single electron might be less than if you're in West Virginia and you're pulling from a lot of coal, right? And so eGrid introduced that regionality element of it, but it still was looking at it as a single annual number for converting electricity usage into our operating emissions impact. The reality is that, again, that's not actually how the grids work. The grids are very dynamic. This is an emissions profile, the national electric grid, a national level from Cambium and runs a Cambium model, which is an hourly grid emissions um, model. It's all over the place, right? And I think in California, you this is probably the state most aware of this, there's been the most conversation about this, but acknowledging that the emissions associated with our electricity use change minute by minute, day by day, hour by hour, season by season, right? Your grid in on a nice, you know, spring day in the middle of the day, you're predominantly on solar. You're seeing really low emissions, right? In the afternoon, in the summer, as the sun's coming down, your natural gas is coming online. Your emissions are going up, right? It's exactly what we're seeing here. And so when we think about buildings, right, the fact that we've been looking at annual, we've lost this level of granularity, which is what impacts our actual operating emissions. Here's just kind of another look at it. Uh, heat map wise, again, we got California um, on one side, and this is just showing that location to location in the country, it's different, but that's a, this very classic example of spring, middle of the day. If your building's using energy, that's a different operating emissions than if your building's using it at the end of the day um, in, in late summer. Um, so what does this mean? Um, this means that we still need to work on efficiency, we still should be looking at on-site renewables, but it's added in this additional factor that we need to be thinking about when our buildings are using energy, right? Not just how much or where it's coming from, but when we're using it. And the reason this is important is that buildings, right? We're part of a larger system. When we talk about decarbonizing the energy use of a building, it's not really the building that we're worried about, right? It's the larger system, right? We're trying to get the grids to decarbonize, the energy systems that we're using, that's what we need to decarbonize. So we are part of that, right? We're not a grid, but we are very much integrated with the grids. And so what our role in buildings can be is helping the grids decarbonize, which then allow our buildings to decarbonize. And the reason I kind of mentioned this is when we look at, this is the profile, this is, this is California. Um, what we see here, because there's a lot of talk right now about grid decarbonization, right? The grids are decarbonizing and they are reducing their emissions and they're heading towards a decarbonized state. But what we see here is the shape is actually not changing that much, right? Great progress was made between 2014 and 2021 with our, our numbers here in terms of pulling total emissions down, but the shape actually didn't change that much. And so what that tells us is that that peak time 
we still have to figure out how to solve that peak time of use um, on the building side. Uh, and I'll just pull it into an example here. So this is um, a project uh, located in the Southeast. Um, and so the, the gray on the, on the side here, that's the emissions profile for a single day. Um, so the grid emissions, so that's any unit electricity, that's the emissions profile associated. On the other side, we have the building load profile and kind of the greenish, and then a PV generation um, in yellow. So this was a net positive energy building. What we see in terms of the emissions profile of the building is if we um, look on the on the one side here that if we don't count, if we don't give ourselves credit for the excess generation we had in the middle of the day and just say, well, we didn't use the grid, so we get to zero. What we see is our net positive energy building actually still has a fairly significant operating emissions impact. And even if we give ourselves credit for having given our excess PV back to the grid, we still are not zero carbon. We still have an emissions impact um, with our net positive energy building, even though on that annual level, the math worked out, on that hourly level, the math did not work out. And so what this is all coming down to is that we on the building side need to help the grids figure out how to pull the peaks down. There's only so much that it can do, right? We kind of have a, they flip this a little bit of an attitude in our industry of like, we don't have to worry about decarbonization. The grids are going to take care of it. We just need to electrify and we're good to go, right? And there's definitely some amount of accuracy in that. And electrification is absolutely the right path forward. But for the grids to decarbonize, buildings do have a role to play in the success of that effort. And pulling peaks down is the key element in that. So that brings us to the idea of a grid interactive building, which is essentially the idea of a building that is not just asking from the grid and saying, I need this much at any time that I ask, but rather it's saying, I need this much, grid, can you provide it? Grid says, yes, I can, no problem. Or grid says, actually, I can't provide it right now, but I could provide it a little bit later. Can you adjust your operations? And building says, yep, I sure can. That's grid interactive building, right? It's change, changing the relationship between buildings and grids, to instead of being sort of this one direction we've always had, to being operating more as a unified system. Um, I might skip over this one actually, just because I know we're running a little bit of time here. Um, so what does this mean for building design? So what this means is that right in the past, we really haven't had to think that much about what was happening on the grid side of our meters. We just sort of knew that whatever we asked for, the grids would provide, right? You size your service, you know that it's sized correctly, the grid will provide what you ask when you ask. And that has historically how we've always operated. What this shift is meaning is that, again, it's we are changing our relationships. And so this idea in the past, the grids shape supply to match demand, right? Whatever we asked for, they provided, no questions asked. Now where we're moving towards is that the grids will shape demand to match supply, right? It will say, instead of if all the buildings are like, we all need energy right now, and the grid says, well, the sun is setting, we don't have as much PV. Could you hold off a little bit? We got wind coming online in five hours. Can you pull down? And the buildings say yes, right? We're having that that allows us to bring in more of those variable resources, right? Which is a very different operating um, place for B for buildings. Um, now I was kind of making a joke about the getting set up um, here earlier. There is actually some. I think there's some lesson in this, right? Is that grid interactive buildings is very, it's 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 very hot topic right now, right? I I presented a green build last year, I'm presenting a green build this year. We just helped with authoring, uh, helped a MBI with a, an ASHRAE guy. Like there's a lot of talk about grid interactive buildings right now. And I can tell you from the perspective of practitioners, the designers, we've helped with commissioning our own building is grid interactive. There is a lot of work to be done before this is a, a running smoothly approach, right? We still struggle with building controls that are not grid interacted, right? To have something where we add that extra layer of, of complexity. 
um, the industry has a ways to go before this is just ready to roll out and we're good to go. But it is coming. And that's kind of why we wanted to make sure to touch on it today is that it's my personal opinion. And again, this is this, this is what I work on. The market's not there just yet for like, everybody's good interactive. Um, but element, elements of it are ready. And the microgrids that we're talking about today are actually one of the first elements that are ready for this kind of grid interactive um, future state. Um, the one thing that I want to kind of end on this before we move on to resilience, and this will be sort of a common theme throughout, we're talking very much about active systems in this presentation, right? Microgrids are very much active systems. A lot of the grid interactive building, there's a lot of discussion around, um, you know, heating and cooling, hot water is one of the biggest topics, EVs is one of the biggest topics, particularly, in, you know, California, both of those are, are pretty mainstream discussions at this point. Um, I do want to just remind everyone, particularly since architects, um, passive first <laughs> and then active, as much as my engineering heart loves the active system, um, passive first. Um, one of the ways that we're finding of that you can really pull down the peaks for this grid, grid supportive, I would call it buildings, is through passive solutions still. So it, it was all of what we're talking about today. I do just want to emphasize, even though we're focusing on the active systems, all of these solutions start passive solutions first, pull down those peaks, develop that resiliency through well-designed buildings, and then we can come in and add in those active systems. Okay. Yeah. Um, so among various goals, there are actually many goals and potential benefits of using a microgrid for a project. Uh, but one of the ones that we've um, mentioned a few times here already and what, what we'd like to talk about now is resiliency. Um, and as a general concept, um, resiliency is about uptime, meaning continuity of operation for even as there are fluctuations in things like uh, power supply to a, a building. And we can define resiliency resiliency uh, a bit more specifically as robustness, resourcefulness, rapid recovery, and redundancy before ours. I guess it's I guess it's five hours. But there's two key questions here that we really think about when we say, what does that mean for any particular project? And that's number one, what is the resiliency event? And number two, how is resilient operation defined? And the answers to the, those questions are what's going to guide any particular uh, project toward the appropriate resiliency solutions. So let's look at the first uh, question. What is the resiliency event? So these are a few examples, possible examples, um, definitely not all inclusive, but uh, some examples of resiliency events that could occur, which might affect one or more building systems. Um, there's the, the key here is that the services that are at risk for each one of these are potentially different. Um, pandemic versus earthquake versus severe weather, utility outage, wildfire, they're all, they all have different impacts to building systems. And in fact, if, if we're talking about a pandemic, for example, which is fresh in all of our memories, um, the available services may be completely uninterrupted, but yet we still need to consider other types of uh, systems and how they're impacted, such as indoor air quality. And so the mindset that we need to start with when we're designing for resiliency is that if we're designing a facility uh, that's intended to mitigate risks for, say, severe weather, uh, we may take the design in a completely different direction from if we're designing for earthquakes or wildfires or extended utility outages. Mm -hmm. And then the second question, how is resiliency or resilient operation defined? Um, likewise, this can also make a very big difference. I, I think we're all pretty used to designing more on this side here on the left side for life safety uh, evacuation, that level of resiliency. Um, because that's code minimum. Uh, we need to be able to safely evacuate all occupants, and that is a form of resiliency. But I think really what we're talking about here today is going beyond this. And how the big questions here, the sub questions are how much of the facility needs to continue operating and for how long? So if we maybe go the next step and say that perhaps we have a building that uh, 
we need to operate it for up to say 24 hours after a utility outage or other event that cuts off power to the building. Uh, then we, second part of the question, how much of the building needs to continue operating? Maybe it could be essential functions only. Going beyond that, perhaps we need to shelter in place for a longer term. Uh, the building needs to continue its essential, essential operations for up to two or three days. And maybe more of the building needs to be backed up. Maybe there could be even multiple approaches within the same type of project. And we'll see that in um, at least one of the case studies we'll look at uh, pretty soon. Going all the way to the far end of the spectrum would be complete off-grid business as usual operation where all loads are backed up and fully capable of running in essentially indefinitely. Now that's that's a, a fairly extreme case just simply because we find that most projects don't typically require that. Um, but it, it can depend on the project. It, overall, it depends greatly on the type of facility and the owner's goals and budget. So although today's focus is on microgrids, which are primarily related to power, uh, we do want to be clear that resiliency overall is about more than just power. Uh, after all, facility operation depends on um, water systems, uh, services and programming, operations, communications, all of these things can be essential. And so, um, and actually even just looking at power systems here, although that's the title, it can really be thought of more as energy in a more general sense as well. Um, and here we're talking specifically today about um, primarily power systems, given that this is microgrid and building and landscape and how that integrates. Um, but uh, again, we want to be clear that keeping a fully holistic view on resilience is crucial to supporting operations during any resiliency event. And it gets back to one of the two original questions. What is the event? And therefore, what are the areas that we need to focus on for any particular project? Um, uh, as well as uh, what uh, Karina had said here to, to reemphasize that the steps to building a resilient solution can involve a key concept here uh, that we want to emphasize, which is that it's built through layering of solutions. And so active components, PV, battery, even beyond that to generators, they can always be added later. But it's key that the building itself should always be designed to run as best as possible. Um, in one sense of thinking about this, the building itself, it, it shouldn't be way outside of the target operating parameters even after a resiliency event occurs if at all possible or in other words no one should should die because the power went out and the building was you know way too hot or cold um there are other life safety reasons why we might need power for say you know of course medications treatments etc um, for certain types of facilities but the point is that no one should have a life safety concern because of the environmental conditions of the building. And if the design is resilient and efficient from day one, uh, from the beginning of design rather, uh, this first step can be a lot higher. So the, the remaining two steps can be a lot shorter and therefore the adds to a project that are necessary are, are not that much uh, to swallow. And also as a side bonus, of course, in terms of efficient, uh, efficiency specifically, I always come back to the concept that the, the cheapest watts are the ones you never use. And so it makes sense to invest in baseline building performance as the top priority and then see what you need to add from there. Okay, so specifically about um, microgrids themselves and achieving, uh, achieving resiliency as well as other goals, um, it's there's often different understandings of exactly what a microgrid is, but it's important for us as both engineers and architects, the design team and developers and owners to be aligned on what the actual project goals are when we say we want a microgrid. Uh, there actually is a single definition from the U.S. Department of Energy here. Um, I won't read the entire thing, but the last sentence here is especially important. A microgrid can connect and disconnect from the grid, meaning the utility grid, to enable it to operate in both grid connected or island mode. 
And that's a, a key fact that we'll come back to here as we really look into the, the operation of how a microgrid works. Uh, so it, microgrids can exist at different scales here. We're Mainly, we kind of think about these as uh, a, a building type microgrid focused on a single building. But in truth, it could be expanded up to a grid. A microgrid is just saying it operates like a utility grid, but it's on a smaller scale. Well, that could also apply to, say, a campus of buildings. And in fact, if uh, we, we have had campus type clients who have looked at this as a, um, a multi-building wide solution, which can enable all kinds of additional efficiencies and um, streamlining of operations between buildings. Because if you can imagine how complex perhaps one building is on a microgrid, having multiple buildings under the same owner with different control systems all operating differently is that it's a whole extra layer of complication. So where that opportunity exists, but really uh, can bring some great advantages and it's something to consider. Uh, the conceptual level diagram here of a microgrid shows uh, these, some of the key blocks here that make up the operation of the microgrid. So as, as Karina was showing earlier, the microgrid itself and the controls can enable the key benefits of sustainability and resilience, but the tools that it uses to do this are most commonly PV or other types of renewable on-site production, um, batteries or other types of on-site storage, building loads themselves, and uh, generators, or uh, I'll, I'll call it non-renewable on-site energy sources. Now, what's not shown here is the utility power, which of course is a key energy component, but it's not really part of the microgrid itself. But the point is we can uh, configure these into roughly three operating scenarios. We can, number one, we can have regular grid connecting power, grid connected power supplying building loads. We can have grid interactive PVs and battery systems supplying building loads. And at this point now, we've got what is really pretty much required by 2022 cycle Title 24 energy code. You've probably seen so already that so many buildings fall under the general category of requiring PV and requiring battery. And so the a big question that always uh, is in everyone's minds at this point is, well, don't I already have a microgrid? The, Big difference between baseline and microgrid is really this third scenario, which as I mentioned before, it's that we're adding the, the ability for the PVs and batteries and other types of on-site systems to supply the building loads here, but without the grid present. In other words, it's, it's islanded or it's uh, off-grid. And that is what really makes it a microgrid. And, as we just saw in the definition of a microgrid earlier. The controller is the, the, the brains behind the microgrid. Um, in terms of hardware, we're, we're talking about um, kind of a switchboard style component that houses uh, the, the, the brains of it. But just in terms of what it actually does. The important thing to remember is that we are lucky to have the power grid as it exists in the United States today. It's it's, it's really a pretty amazing achievement that it runs as, as steadily as it does and that it balances power and absorbs all kinds of our building fluctuations as they ramp up and down, as we saw in the graphs earlier. We tend to take that for granted, and it's because the, the utility grid is so enormous, it can absorb those types of fluctuations and just keep running and supply whatever power we need. Well, when we look at a building level microgrid, those types of fluctuations make relatively a much, much bigger swing and can cause uh, instability if they're not properly managed. And so the, the real key here is that we're looking at the different loads of the building just as much as we're looking at the different types of on-site production. And it's that's really what is the the true functionality of a microgrid that you can't get by any sort of manual means or just through PVs or batteries alone is that it dynamically manages 
not only the production, but also matches that through loads. And so dividing up these loads into controllable parts that can be individually switched on and off is actually essential in order to keep uh, stability. As we've shown here in the kind of the lower left corner, no load control equals system instability. So um, designing, main point here being that designing this entire system, of course, involves careful design choices from day one. And so a microgrid is something that you really want to establish as a design goal early on in the project. Yes, it can be done later, but the amount of redesign that it involves can be pretty significant. Required functions of a microgrid here, we've, we've kind of touched on grid interactivity, the ability to island and reconnect, control of power sources and the control of the major loads exactly what we've just been discussing. But the sort of advanced functions that you can also get from a microgrid, whether that's just inherently from it or whether maybe a little extra design can provide these functions are important to keep in mind because we're always thinking about business case and how this really helps our clients to achieve maybe not only resiliency goals, but additional goals as well. Um, so the communications with utility are an advanced one that uh, Karina touched on earlier. Um, and so those can include, um, we actually, it's becoming pretty common to see microgrids, microgrids charging batteries when utility costs are low and then discharging the battery so that we can reduce our demand when utility costs are high. That's often called uh, peak shifting. It's, it's a common uh, term that you hear a lot. Uh, in addition to that, just simply reducing the demand on those peaks during the, the times when energy is most costly, or even reducing it just so you don't demand as much power, uh, which is called peak shaving, all of these things together, just those two can uh, pay for themselves in terms of the batteries and the microgrid system in actually a relatively short amount of time, depending on how you're using the facility. Um, there's also a lot of discussion in the regulatory community right now about how this, uh, how to set this up so that there's more and more economic uh, incentive for developers to invest in microgrids because, I mean, yeah, let's let's face it give people an, a financial incentive to do this rather than just an energy code requirement. Uh, of course, the adoption really is a, a, a more appealing prospect. Uh, so yeah, economic and emissions battery dispatch, economic and emissions load control, and utility ancillary services as well, the grid interactivity part. Um, as we said earlier, uh, the grid has been practically in, infinite source more or less, but now that we're thinking in terms of a microgrid, um, we're working with local resources only. And a, a, key, um, a, a key terminology aspect to consider here is two things. Number one, power or demand, and meaning how much instantaneous electric energy is, is a building using. And furthermore, how long will it be needed or the, uh, the, the consumption? So kilowatt hours, the meaning the, the amount that you see on your energy bill, for example. Um, an important thing here when we're designing microgrids is understanding those two things. So how big does our overall system need to be in terms of delivering power, but also how long does it need to maintain the, that bridge any sort of gaps in, in the utility power? And it's actually the case that most of the time, microgrids don't fully replace the grids. So we saw that spectrum earlier of, are we looking at a short-term solution with some uh, backup of the loads or are we looking at a full business as usual case? And actually the time factor isn't so important as it is to consider how much of the building truly needs to run. And again, it's, it's usually not the entire building because if we look in this uh, graph here, this is from, from an actual building project here. Uh, the data for how much the load here is, the, the load is what's, uh, or I'm sorry, excuse me. The load is the, the more um, consistent line throughout the year as it just happened in this particular case. We've got January on the left and December on the right. And the building load is more or less, you know, we get daily fluctuations up and down, but over a year's perspective, it's more or less the same. 
However, what you can see here is that the, the PV and battery production are vastly different in the summer than they are in the winter. And so it's the case that even if this is a very, you know, positively performing building in terms of PV production, as we can see, there's still several months out of the year where we're pretty reliant on utility power to fill in that gap. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. That could be um, absolutely achieving all of the goals that were set for that project, bringing all kinds of financial uh, benefits to the project, resiliency for, let's say, you know, many hours, maybe a day or so. But the, the key here is that we're still connected to the grid and it's some projects maybe do require full off-grid um, operation, but most don't because we end up overshooting the mark. And we have more batteries than is really financially attractive or even necessary uh, to a building owner. Um, the key thing here, of course, is to get design involved early. And um, it's the design of uh, systems like this is, is frankly pretty you know, complex. There's a lot of thought that needs to go into it. It's part of the electrical discipline, but it's really just as much its own design as say um, telecommunications or uh, uh, other subsets, AV or security or, or similar related disciplines. So key, key takeaway uh, is you think about it as early as possible and try to establish these goals so the design gets on your mind. But Oh, and I'm sorry, this is a, uh, yeah, battery charge, um, uh, showing how that discharges throughout. Uh, yeah, I can add a little bit on this. This, was, this project is in, um, up in the Seattle area. Um, and as you've heard, we do get some rain in the Northwest, um, particularly in the winters. And so one of the challenges in doing resilience design in that climate is that everyone says, oh, what I, I, my battery doesn't have to be that big. I've got PV. It's like, well, your PV in June will be awesome. It's going to be wonderful things for you. Your PV in December is not going to do a whole lot for you. And so that's the problem is that your discharge of your battery with your loads is more than usually your PV is going to be able to help recharge. And so we do end up in that issue of like, even if you have a large battery, you're just each... Each day, you're taking out a little bit more than you're putting back in, and eventually you do end up um, in a fully discharged state um, at that point. But um, yeah, so we'll get into some case studies. And I, well, well, we'll touch on this in one of the case studies. All right, so we're going to go through a couple of case studies. I know we're, everyone's probably getting tired here. But um, all right, so it's huh? very compelling. Good. Oh, I'm a lover. I love it. Awesome. My kind of people. Okay. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, this Beaverton Public Safety Center. Um, so this is in Beaverton, Oregon. Um, and actually, of the examples that were picked, we've got two that are out of Oregon, one that's out of California. And one thing I would mention um, is that if you're working um, in regions outside of California, I feel like a lot of what we're talking about today is becoming much um, much more kind of common, common knowledge and, and talked about in California. California is sort of a bubble in that. Much of the rest of the country, this is all really new stuff. The grid interactivity is like, a lot of folks haven't heard of it. The utilities aren't even ready for it. Um, PV and batteries are still really new technologies. Um, so we kind of picked some of the case studies from some other areas just because um, it can be regionally different depending on you know client familiarity with some of these topics. Um, so this one is in, as I said, is in Beaverton, Oregon. It's public safety. Um, it's a, the, the police um, uh, department for um, Beaverton. And this one was set up as um, a really unique partnership with the utility. So just kind of general building stats. It is all electric. It was developed um, with a fairly you know, low EUI, so high efficiency. It's got a bunch of PV on the roof. They've also got PV in the parking lot. Um, for it. So it's all, it's very well set up um, to be a microgrid. Obviously it's a critical operations facility. And so um, it's also the only seismically resilient building um, in for Beaverton. And so in a major um, earthquake event, it would be the center of operation for the entire city. So in, in addition to just like normal operations, snowstorm kind of resiliency, it also in an earthquake is, is absolute critical operations facility for that too. So excellent candidate. Um, for a microgrid. Um, so this one was a unique partnership with the utility. And again, I mentioned this one just because if you're working in regions outside of California, 
the economics that make batteries and PV work generally pretty favorably in California often don't exist in most other regions because they just have different utility structures in Oregon. Even Washington, for example, um, the rate structures tend to be pretty flat. And so that incentive to put in and it's flat and low. And so the incentive to put in a battery isn't there. Whereas in California, you can use it to take your you know, peak time of use charges down and it generally pays for itself. Again, that's a little bit of a California unique structure. So this one was important. This partnership with the utility was really important to make this economically feasible for the project. What the pilot project did is that the grid, so the utility, um, Portland General Electric, notice there's no and in there, it's the other PGE. Um, what Portland General Electric did, they are interested in having batteries distributed out for that grid interactive piece that we talked about of pulling peaks down. So they have interest in having batteries at customer sites because it helps with grid purposes, right? And so, what the agreement was is that we had a we here we had an owner who wanted a grid who wanted a battery for resilience purposes. We had a utility who wanted a battery for grid support purposes. We said, well, what if we get together, use one asset to solve both of our problems? And so the battery is owned and operated by the utility, but physically sited at the customer site. And so with the microgrid. What that allows is that during normal operations, the utility is able to charge and discharge the battery in a way that helps them work their systems. And in an emergency situation, the battery is there to provide resilience to microgrid for um, the buildings. So we kind of, this just sort of graphically shows sort of kind of some of the things that Mike was talking about, but just in terms of the three operating states for this project, we have normal operation, grid power is there, the battery is there supporting the grid, the PV is there going back you know, to the building and then going back to the grid. And then we have the grid outage situation where the microgrid is active. PV, the battery are working to support the building. This project also does have a diesel generator. Um, and then we have the kind of more, the life safety operations, which is more of what we traditionally think of life safety, 90 minutes, you got everybody to get out. I mentioned this, this part as well is that uh, one of the other common questions we get on microgrid projects is, well, I have a battery, so that means I don't have to do you know, anything for, for egress, you know, life safety lighting or anything like that. We have, and this is an excellent example, this was the very first commercial building microgrid in the region, very first one that our AHJ had seen or worked with. And one of the ways that we were able to successfully get it through permit was to have a very, um, very traditional approach to the life safety systems. And so that they were comfortable that those requirements were being met and that the microgrid, the rest of the microgrid was providing this additional resiliency that they were comfortable with what they were seeing on life safety. And this is something that I've done on, I think at this point, all of our microgrid projects is we still kept some of those kind of NEC 700 and 701 systems more independent and the AHJs seem to be a lot more comfortable with that. And then the grid interactive part of it is separate. So I just kind of do want to mention that because there are kind of cost considerations and complexities on that, but that does seem to be generally what the permitting um, group seem to be more, more comfortable with. Okay, next one, uh, so PAE Living Building, this one's in Portland, same uh, utility actually, also Portland General Electric. Um, so this one, it's living buildings, obviously very, very high efficiency. We talked about that passive piece of it. Uh, we have on-site PV on the roof, and then we have a battery on the first floor um, in a dedicated room, and we have a, a, uh, a full microgrid, and this is also a very, very grid interactive system. The reason is, is that the area that we're located in downtown Portland doesn't actually, has historically never had any net metering on it. Net metering being when you have excess PV, you put it back onto the grid. Um, and the reason was because of uh, this, just some technical elements of the downtown grid, but it was that there's a limit in how much can be put back onto the grid. And if you go above that limit, the end of civilization. And so they just never have allowed anybody to do that because nobody was able to guarantee that they could stay within that limit. Luckily, we've got a great relationship with them. They know us and they trust us. And so we were able to sit at a table and said, okay, but if we did do it, what would it have to look like? <laughs> Um, and so we came up with a solution that allows us to connect to the grid, but it has to be within that limit. And so it's a very, very grid interactive system because if we go over that limit, they shut us down. So the stakes are fairly high. Um, 
And so because of that, that's where we have um, a grid interactive microgrid on it. Um, and so this is that kind of that true grid interactive building we talked about. And the reason I did kind of make, you know, the a miracle occurs here fine print sort of comment is that this, we, we, we designed this building, we commissioned this building, we are owning and operating this building, we are in this building. It's hard to commission these systems. The, the like I said, the, the industry is just not quite there yet. We have ended up providing um, a lot of a lot of support to the vendors, to our trade partners to help get this thing up and running. And so I very much believe that this is this is coming and we're going to get there. <laughs> but I do just want to put that kind of cautionary tale out that we absolutely should be doing this on all of our projects, but make sure that you and your clients are going into it with open eyes, knowing that this is still kind of an emerging solution and there are a lot of bumps on the road still. Um, it can be done, but it, you know, give yourself, give yourself a, a time on the commissioning piece of it um, because they are, they are still really quite new um, in terms of industry deployment. Um, and on this one, so as Mike talked about that question of what, when you want it in a resilience operation, what do you want it to be? Um, so we are a, a fully seismically, a category four seismic resilient building. And so there is that possibility that in a major Cascadia earthquake event, that this would be the building in downtown Portland that's still operating. And so we think of it not only in hours and days, but potentially weeks. Um, and so it gets into that question of like, well, how, how resilient do you really want to be? And how much is it worth to you? And how much space do you have? And how much money do you have? Because there is the, the answer of like, you can just put more batteries on it. That is always an answer, right? You can just put more on it. Um, but as one of my clients told me when we when we were presenting his uh, load reduction battery size and his no load reduction battery size, he said, well, I can't afford to be God-proof. So we're gonna go with the load reduction battery size. And that is that is sort of the that balance that you have to have. Is it understanding within the different requirements of a project, what's the right size, you know, for, for what the ask really is. In our case, we had size and space constraints um, and obviously cost constraints. And so for us, we decided, we kind of landed on a size that was appropriate for us, knowing that um, given that it's a very efficient building, we can probably run for a pretty long time. Certainly in the summer, our loads are pretty low, our PV's going well, we could run for months potentially. If we had it have something happen during a winter event and it was really cold outside or we didn't, our PV panels are covered in snow. It's obviously less time, but there's load shedding that we can do. We can start to isolate the building down till we get to the point where we just kind of have a core operation. And so that's how we balance that in terms of what is a reasonable system size and then um, how, do, how do we operate to stay within that. Um, and the last one I'm gonna mention, this is a little bit tangential we're talking about here, but I, I just kind of want to put the idea we're trying to get this idea out into the world more. Um, so you'll notice on our on our project um, from the street view, you can't see the PV. So for a living building, if anyone's familiar with Bullet Center or Candida, they have kind of those more um, dramatic canopies, PV canopies that are part of it, which allows them to be net zero on site, five story building, you know, in urban cores. We don't have that because of the historic district in Portland. We're not allowed to have PVs be visible from street view. Um, and so we ended up donating about half of our system to a nearby affordable housing project. We do not have virtual net metering in Oregon. And so um, getting credit for the electricity generation, but there's just not a path to do that. So it was truly a donation to them. They own the system and they own all the energy that's generated. It goes back to their house loads, offsets their operating costs, which is money that goes back into their programming. And when we talked about, remember at the beginning, we talked about net zero energy isn't actually zero carbon. Having all your PV on your own building helps your math work out, right? But when we look at that whole grid scale, having it a little bit more distributed, there's some interesting advantages that come to that. And so I do just want to kind of encourage, you know, this group to think about when we talk about net zero energy or net zero carbon, thinking beyond just our own project and rethinking of it in terms of that community scale and that grid scale. Um, and if there's opportunities for us to do uplift, not only of our own projects, but of um, others in our community. 
And here for last case study, this is very local example here uh, in Menlo Park. Um, this is a project actually I'm the project manager for, um, as well as electrical engineer of record. Uh, the uh, city of Menlo Park had um, completely redone their, wanted to completely redo their uh, community campus. Uh, this is um, a project here that's a 29,000 square foot community center and swimming facility with a lot of different program types uh, on the inside of the building and we're doing full design for it. Um, but they had interest in uh, doing this as a microgrid. And the big reason for this is that this building is intended to operate as a Red Cross emergency shelter for extended operation during really any number of resiliency events. So we had to look really kind of broad spectrum for this. Um, uh, but a key question in this, as, as we'll see in the next slide, is what portions of the building truly need to operate in a resiliency event? Even though it's a community campus, certain functions may not be necessary, but what are the key parts that are needed for long-term uh, assistance to local residents who are adversely affected by a disaster, for example? And so in this case, we have photovoltaics, uh, PVs, um, batteries, which BESS, battery energy storage system, as well as temporary standby diesel generators, which by the way, can be um, kind of a creative solution as they were here for a project that can potentially run on uh, for, a, for a short period of time on its local batteries, but for extended runtime, it was known that bringing in those non-renewable energy sources on site, such as temporary generators, would be an option. And that saved all of the cost of putting permanent generators on site. Worked out really well, it took, took some careful design uh, to be able to integrate that with a microgrid, but that's something that the, the, the brains of the microgrid can manage. And uh, for code required backup, standard emergency lighting inverter. And I think that was something that Karina touched on that I do want to maybe emphasize here is that this question as well that always comes up, which is that can microgrid batteries be used as a source of emergency backup? The answer is maybe at some point in the future, there might be, uh, I could absolutely see that as a, a great synergy in a way to make more use of the, the on-site batteries. But at the current time, the microgrid should really be looked at as an alternate source of normal or grid power. That's an important thing to remember. Yes, they can absolutely back up emergency systems, but at the current time with current laws and regulations and just the, the, the absolute necessity of keeping life safety systems running, it's, it's important to keep those as an alternate power source as well by themselves. And so this battery storage system here in terms of physicality of kind of what, what does this look like? Uh, a great advantage of this site was that we were able to um, have these outdoors, which is something that as a general approach is, I think it's safe to say our, our recommendation is that battery systems are great things to put outside. We are lucky to be living now in a time when there are packaged battery solutions, like from Tesla here, as you see, or from um, other providers that are pretty much all inclusive and they even look okay, you know, for electrical equipment and integrating those on site can really be a lot easier than doing battery rooms on the interior of a building. If anyone here, I'm, I'm sure there's many of you have probably designed battery rooms, and you know that it's it can be complicated with spill containment and ventilation and things like that. But it can be done either way. Just as a general recommendation, though, this is a great way to go. Um, the the approach to this project was to have both short term and long term backup. And I anyway, well, there's there's portions of the building that are supported for a shorter period of time. And there are portions that are supported for a longer period of time with the option to bring them all online, depending on whether we've brought in additional generators, whether PV production has been especially good for those periods of days, or whether we need to conserve power. And um, having those tiers allows this project, especially just that extra level of flexibility um, 
to enable the project to meet whatever goals are thrown at it, whether that's during Red Cross operation or whether that's backing it up just through any normal power outage. Um, what you can see here is this is a this is our single line diagram of the generator board. Uh, the the important takeaway here is is that there are components in here that have been specifically designed for the purposes of being a microgrid. If we had not put that in, this would have looked a lot different. It would have been um, it would have been a lot more standard in terms of breakers, but in layout and other things like that. But as is, it is a um, complex design that really needs not only electrical engineering expertise, but really microgrid engineering expertise. As I said earlier, it's it's really its own discipline. And so in this sense, we worked hand in hand with Karina's team and as sort of the electrical renewable energy systems teamwork to identify how the loads were going to be split out, how they were going to be controlled, in this case with automatic motorized breakers, and how that would all get integrated into the space that was available. Definitely a team effort. This is actually that's a picture from about six months ago. We're we're actually much farther in construction at this point and getting ready to start commissioning. So fingers crossed. Um yeah. All right, so we'll kind of wrap it up. Um, so I think you know, summarize right, microgrids, why are they such a hot topic right now? We've got our sort of um no, I'm not even, but I'm not going to mess with it. All right. Um, I don't need that. says microgrid benefits. Um, so resilience, sustainability, financial, right? We're a, we are getting calls all the time now. Everybody wants a microgrid and for really good reasons. Um, and these are kind of the main ones that we are seeing them for, right? They're becoming more and more relevant as sort of our the reality of our world is, is starting to shift a little bit. And so it can be a really excellent um, value that gets brought to projects. And there's a future proofing element, right, is that it is allowing our projects to move into the somewhat uncertain future in terms of energy systems and, and just general, you know, sustainability discussions and then some um, ability to protect from financial as grid rate schedules change and all that sort of stuff. And so good reasons to be talking microgrids on projects. Um, the key considerations, Mike kind of touched on some of these, the best time to include a microgrid is an early design. I, after every, again, I live up in the Northwest, but every time we have like a major snowstorm, because we're not prepared for snow, but we're starting getting snowstorms. Um, we have a major snowstorm, everyone's power goes out. I got a whole bunch of calls for microgrids and it's always like, well, what stage is your project in? Well, we just broke ground yesterday. I'm like, ah, <laughs> okay. I'm like 12 months too late. Um, it, I would say that, you know, my kind of touch on this, I think there's still sort of a memory, collective memory of what PV ready meant, right? Which PV ready meant you kind of have a conduit from your roof to your electrical room and you save a little bit of wall space. That is not microgrid ready. As Mike said, it fundamentally changes the way that we do the electrical distribution in buildings. It changes everything. It can change how we're doing controls, the electrical, the main distribution board, how we do the layout, how we slice and dice the building around. It microgrid ready is a you really need to have that conversation at the very beginning of a project. Is this something that is really critical to the project? Do we want it? Do we think we might want it? And making sure that that conversation happens very early. Um, we are starting to do some projects where we're doing retrofits um, on existing buildings and adding microgrids kind of ahead of the main. But again, there's complexities and challenges that come with that. It also eliminates some of that ability to reduce your battery size with other, you know, load shifting, you know, schemes and things like that. So I do just want to encourage if you have projects that you think might, this might be of interest to them, it's important for what the project values are, have that conversation really early and get that as a decision point in the beginning. Um, they do require more space. Again, Mike's example, and this is true for all of the ones that we have, the, obviously the hardware itself, like the batteries are a decent footprint but just the number, kind of the controls and some of um, the breakers that are required in the distribution boards, it can increase your distribution board by three, four, or six feet, right? We're talking some real sizes here, depending on the size of your project. And so again, knowing early if that's happening can help in that space planning for your MEP room. They do still add first cost right now. Um, battery prices, they were coming down and then they plateaued. Um, same thing PV actually, although it's not 
quite as crazy as the rest of what's happening with electricals. You want a generator, you better get in line now. Um, same thing with a transformer. Um, but they do add costs, right? We're kind of all anticipating prices are going to start coming down again with sort of the IRA money um, coming out and some of the investments that are happening with um, manufacturing, but they do still cost money for the hardware piece of it, the controls piece of it as well. Um, it is truly a brain and it is, um, can add, you know, we're talking a hundred thousand dollars is not unreasonable um, for the control system. And so again, understanding really early if this is a value, a critical value for the project. Um, so that way that's getting included in there. Um, the coordination with utilities, like I said, you know, we kind of highlighted some of these projects. A lot of these were first or one of the first um, microgrid projects with the utilities. Even in California, um, we're, we're doing a couple um, kind of first ever projects um, with the big, the big folks here. And we're having a lot of really close conversations with them. This is a new world for them, right? Just as we talked about, it's a new relationship for us with them. It's a very new relationship for them with us. And there's a lot of concerns that they have about what we're doing on our side is gonna cause reliability and, and you know, issues on their side. And so having that conversation real early, and again, outside of this region, when you get kind of in the rest of the country, we have conversations with utilities and they're like, yeah, I read an article about this microgrid thing once, right? And that's that's the level of this. They don't have standards. They don't have policies on it, right? And so having that conversation really early is critical. Um, same thing, AHJs and contractors. Like I said, we ended up on our own project being a lot more involved than we had expected. We're, we're grateful that we have partners who are still working with us on it, but it was ended up being a lot more newness than they were expecting. And we're finding that pretty consistently. Everyone's coming up the learning curve together. Again, we're gonna get there. I just know it, but um, we're all right now, everybody's in a bit of a learning curve um, for this. And so just kind of factor that into timelines and, and construction and commissioning schedules. Um, and then, yeah, as, as we've kind of talked about here at this point, kind of our general feel of from the world of AHJs is that it's better to consider these backups for the normal power, but to keep your emergency, your code required emergency power, keep that pretty separate and pretty standard looking. Um, and that can help a lot in those um, conversations with your, with your permit officials. All right, and then I'll just end it again. One last pitch in the grid interactive building, We're starting to think about our buildings from the sustainability standpoint and sort of this more three-dimensional view of like high performance, right? Efficiency, on-site renewables, but then starting to think about flexible loads. What does that mean? And what can we do in our building designs to make our, uh, what one of my, uh, one of my architect friends calls uh, a good grid citizens. Um, and how can we design our buildings to be good grid citizens? This is, this is kind of the next big thing for our industry to tackle. So I sort of wanted to leave you with that. All right, that is so much information to throw, throw at you on Thursday night. Questions? <laughs> yeah. So uh, on the topic of load shedding, does that mean um, okay, like in a situation where you want to keep your air conditioner on, but it's it increases the load, so the building wants to turn it on uh, for the grid. Who who would win? Would your building turn your air conditioner off even though you wanted it on for load shedding? Yeah, I so in the there's the grid conversation and there's the microgrid conversation on it. So that's when I say that the grid interactive piece is like it's it's theory that's starting to move into reality, some of those questions are still kind of getting sorted out, right? Um, and what does it look like, right? And there's systems that are easier to do it, like hot water is kind of the first one, and that's, you know, at the point in California, it's starting to become almost standard, right? Your hot water heater will turn off when your grid asks it to turn off, and that may be fine because it sits and holds it in the tank. Nobody notices. The occupants aren't aware of it. Where it gets more dicey is if things that the occupants might notice, right? Of things like temperature ranges get expanded. And that's where it comes into what we're seeing, at least with a number of the, um, the initial programs with utilities is that, well, different utilities have different, have different approaches to it, but most of them currently allow kind of a, I want out, option to say, nope, I'm not going to participate in this. They say, hey, can I turn, can I change your loads? And you say, yeah, go ahead. 
where you say, no, nope, I don't want to participate in this one. Well, and so it's voluntary. I mean, uh, to ask the question in a simple way, this, this brain you put in, this smart controller, can you can you program it in such a way that the, the user wins, the battle between the user and the grid? You can set it that for sure my air conditioner will, will be on. I, yeah. I will have the final say. The and that's the override that says, nope, I'm not going to participate in this demand response program. Okay. I'm operating as normal. Um, so the, far, there's only really a couple of, in California here, there are only a couple of ways that it's required by law that you have to be able to do that. And lighting is one of them where there is a demand response requirement in, in current Title 24 energy code that went into effect, I, I think, seven or eight years ago. And, but even in that case, they still require you to meet all of the safety requirements and all of the light level requirements and all of that as well. It's just a matter of you also need to designate at least some areas in your building that can shed a bit of lighting. To my knowledge, I don't- oh, Wait, so you're saying written in the law that the grid will turn your lights off when it wants to turn them off. So it, it only says- like your liberty. It only says that it has to be capable of doing that upon request. But so, to my knowledge, none of them have actually, PGE hasn't actually started requesting, but they could. Well, um, I mean, rolling blackouts are a way of doing it, right? Uh, so that's, 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 yeah, yeah, all yeah, that's, that's, that's yeah. the load reduction. That's yeah. A, that's the load reduction with that in the recourse. So I, I think on a practical level, there's all kinds of ways that, that could happen. Um, so uh, I'm kind of curious, though, that. Uh, like, who do you even talk to at pg &E? It's a multi-headed beast. Which head do you talk to to you begin a conversation? So in terms of design, uh, we we always have, from a you know relatively early project stage, we always have a, a representative from pg &E who's there to, to speak with us and act on behalf of pg &E for that project. They're the first point of contact for any of these discussions. Um, as more of a um, kind of a holistic entity, though, um, and, and let's say we, we weren't talking about a project in general, um, I mean, PGE has there are, has certain divisions that are kind of more involved in this sort of thing than others. However, this is so early, and as, as Karina mentioned, it's many of them have never really gotten into this sort of load reduction. Um, or demand response area beyond just kind of like, well, maybe someday that's where the grid is going. At this point, yeah, it's it's there's not that level of interactivity to the point where they're saying, okay, you must reduce by 30% or you, that building must reduce by 50 or 60% is not happening yet. Right. Um, so on the, but to put it onto your project, I, I don't know that there's like, a one person you call yet, and again, it's not this is, no microgrids. Yeah, and I again, I this is like it's not just and this is kind of everywhere, and that's why that like early microgrid thing. It often takes a little while to work through the labyrinth to find the right person. Even pg e where this is becoming more common, and this is in more like territories, it just takes a little bit. It's not a not normal or not a not a business as usual utility coordination effort. It takes more time and then uh the other question is are there incentives for installing a microgrid financial or uh, regulatory so i would say in california it's it's interesting an incentives right it's kind of this carrot or stick it, california to be honest it's a little bit more stick at this point because of what your utility rate structure is right you are penalized for using you know high loads during that kind of four to 8 p.m. window, right? And so it's more, much more of a stick of like, you you get to pay less money <laughs> if you put a microgrid in, not that you get money for putting a microgrid, but you will pay less operating costs, right? It's an anti-carrot. You know? It's, yes, yeah. yeah. It's a, I don't know what an anti is. It's a, it's a, yes, it's a very dry carrot. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> Is that's kind of where the moon, and that's why they actually they do tend to make economic sense. The grid interactive version of them, the energy resilience is just a bonus, right? You already bought it for this other reason. It has a first cost, right? But if your operating costs can get pulled down, that we've seen it two to anywhere from two to five years, that battery can pay for itself. 
adding in that resilience operation, that true microgrid function, right? And to Mike's point, right? Having it only be grid interactive and not able to operate resilience is an option, right? You can have PV and battery that go offline when the utility goes offline, it saves you a lot of controls. Um, and you can do that, right? But if you've already bought the battery and you do want the resilience, because you guys do have PSP at the events regularly now, right? Um, that's where you have bought the asset, you can use it for this additional benefit. And maybe that means you don't buy a diesel generator, right? Which has its own environmental and cost and maintenance considerations with it. Yeah, I was just gonna follow up on the battery technology. I have a suggestion and a question. Suggestion is to add that layer to this about the life cycle investment in the battery itself because batteries have a pretty limited lifespan, right? At this point, and so if you are going to bother to invest just doing it for resilience, you're putting a lot of money into a rainy day scenario. So being able to to do the microgrid and like how does the controller cost offset the actual battery costs? You know, if you're getting a return on the investment on a daily basis as opposed to waiting for the rainy day, I think that's a really interesting overlay application. And then my question is um what you guys are seeing on the battery technology side of this, because my I work with multifamily housing and it sort of feels like the missing middle of battery technology. We've got the Tesla power walls and you can gang them up and put them on your site and have the space in the Bay Area we don't. So and then you have the large scale batteries for a hospital. But what are you guys seeing any development? Are you do you have any industry partners? Are you like where are we going on that piece of like getting the right size battery for the, the majority of, of middle size buildings? Can I tag on to that? Sure. Because <laughs> my question was going to be that, but how do you provide resiliency for a um uh your fire sprinkler pump um to get your fire pump? Because what we've been told right now is there's not a battery that can power a fire pump. Yeah, I guess a couple. Well, I'm very honest. So a couple on that. So you the missing middle, you're totally right. And I would not I <laughs> Struggle with it every day. <laughs> There's a missing middle. Um, ELM microgrid, honestly, is one of the products that we're specking on a lot because they kind of hit that middle spot right there. Um, there's not a lot, and you're you're that's it's a problem right now. And I think it's just because it's not where the big markets are for them, right? The single family residential that's turning into a big market, and the grid scale is turning into a big market, and so batteries are not mature technology yet the way that pv is so everybody's getting in the game it's kind of the wild west i mean it's what pv was kind of 15 20 years ago like everybody's got an idea right and so we're seeing a lot of investment in those two sectors and not a lot in that kind of that missing middle so there's a couple groups but even that it's you know every time we think we find somebody then they just say oh yeah we're getting out of that market we're just doing utility now i mean the tesla kind of had it had a middle middle sized one and then they decided to to get rid of that so i don't have a good answer for that in terms of the chemistries um right now most of what we're seeing is the lfp the lithium iron phosphate um which is uh has some benefits in terms of locating it inside some of the fire risks that came with the previous lithium technologies um chemistries are, have been addressed in the chemistry of the LFP. So like in our, our building, our, we're in a downtown urban core. We don't have, we're, prop, we're lot line to lot line, right? And so our, our battery is inside of our building. As Mike said, if we can put it outside, we really like to put it outside. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it you a lot on fire protection thoughts, but- I was gonna say, can we slip the fire market? <laughs> <laughs> we actually, though, it's, <laughs> We actually did. We went above and beyond what was required because at the time the Oregon codes, we saw the Oregon codes and we're like, we don't think that's ad adequate. So like, first time in my life, I was like, we're going to, we're going to do more than you're asking for because we don't think it's adequate. Um, but it does add a cost and that's, we have a multifamily housing that's been one of the challenges when we had to locate it inside. It's made it, even when they got grant funding for the battery system, the two hour rated room and the extra fire protection, all that sort of stuff made it prohibitive. So I, I think there's, again, there's still kind of an attention right now of where the battery market is, where the fire protection community is, and trying to figure out what everybody's comfortable with. And it's just going to take a little while for kind of everybody to get there. It's not there yet. Again, I would I'd still consider these to be emerging, kind of emerging adoption systems. Um, and in terms of fire pump, um, that, that's a terrific question because 
we uh, it, it, not only does that question come up with regards to utilizing you know battery systems for microgrids and uh, other sort of resilient systems but also just for any project is do I really need do I really need a generator a diesel generator for this um, and this does come back to the 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 point of you kind of ask the question of number one the question should be is this an emergency code required load that absolutely must operate and the answer for a fire pump system is yes I'll caveat that a little bit by saying there there's some there there is some outs depending on whether the power is present. But anyway, most of the time it is. Most of the time you need two separate power sources for it. And so right away, the battery systems that you're using for microgrid, the microgrid really cannot stand in as the power source for a fire pump, an elevator that needs to be on, um, backup power, lighting, fire alarm, those sorts of standard loads. A uh, uh, smoke control is another one. However, I, you know, I mean, maybe at some point that could happen. And then the question then becomes, and let's say we didn't even have a microgrid, just to go ahead and answer the question, can a battery be used for backup of it? You're absolutely right that batteries are, they can be used to back up things like motors, but they're not very good. They're not very efficient at it. I'll put it that way. Uh, generators can absorb large inrush current type things like large motors. And they're just, they're quite good at that. And there are some advantages to generators to the point where you might say, if you have a building that has um, fire pump or elevators or smoke control fans, oftentimes it just actually is better design to provide a small generator specifically for those things rather than a, a warehouse full of batteries. I, there, there's nothing really sustainable you know, when you're talking well, about that. Much, yeah, but. exactly. And I, I want to touch on that actually for a second here because so we're, and I, I don't, I can't release the data yet. We're doing a study right now that's actually looking at the embodied emissions mm -hmm. of generators versus batteries. And I do want to touch on that point because when we talk about whole life LCA, right, re thinking about the whole thing, we have to remember that batteries are tools for decarbonization. They are not themselves a decarbonization solution, right? They are a tool to facilitate that, but they do come with their own embodied emissions considerations, right? And fossil fuels, for all of their faults, are really energy dense resources. That is why they changed the course of civilization the way that they did it, right? And so, in terms of that, if you're not going to use it very often, like a fire pump, hopefully you never use it ever, right? The hope is that that whatever's diesel in that generator is not ever being used. Oh, yes. That's the one for my bet. It, I mean, in terms of overall, right, to Mike's point, the batteries that you would have to have to support that fire pump versus that monthly testing amount, what are, again, and I, I shouldn't even be sharing this, but the report's coming soon, um, is that the embodied emissions equation does not work out in favor of the warehouse of batteries. <laughs> If you're going to be using it for PSPS events, if you have other reasons you need to use it, right? If it's going to be off-grid operation, there's a million of other reasons why the batteries are the better solution. If you're doing grid interactivity, if you're doing all those things, absolutely that comes out ahead from an emission standpoint than generators. But for a fire pump specifically, where it's really, really, really low usage, be careful. We got to be, and as an industry, we have to be careful that we don't make the refrigerants. <laughs> so we have to think whole life cycle right so even if even if it was suitable and and legal to put it on a microgrid there are reasons why you might not want why you, it may not make any sense at all to support it with batteries however there was the example that we have earlier where microgrids can incorporate generator emergency backup generators into them they can be an on-site source of power so um, it, it can be, it's, it's all part of the sort of holistic whole. So when I say it's not part of the microgrid, it kind of is. It's just that it's not part of the, uh, it, it's really dedicated to code uh, life safety. And I will, we have a client that we're working with that's exactly where they're landing. So they have a large campus. It has um, 
life safety considerations around it. And when we looked at their outage history for their site, most of their outages were three hours or less. And so sizing a three hour battery for them gets most of what they need. They did have a couple kind of crowded shopping situations that were like seven hours or 12 hours because they have a life safety condition on their campus. They, they can't lose power at all. But by doing a battery, a reasonably sized battery, we were able to take 80% of their situation. And then we have the generator for those really catastrophic conditions. So in terms of their usage, it pulls it down. It doesn't, they still have to do the monthly testing and that kind of stuff. So it's not a zero, but that was a good way for us to kind of balance those two from, again, that holistic emissions viewpoint. That was a good balance for that project. Are you able to reduce the generator size as part of it? Not the size, but the generator, how often it would be used. The total fuel usage on the site was brought down to almost zero on an annual basis. Could a fuel cell ever replace like generator? Potentially, and hydrogen is like green hydrogen is a real topic these days. I don't know. Yeah. So yeah, I've had some projects that have looked into that as well. Um, but the fuel cells are potentially a, a source of that, but it has to be designed somewhat carefully for that. And a big consideration, I'll tell you what it is that usually kind of drives it back a little bit towards generators. Not always, but sometimes is the fact that you need a reliable source of fuel for them to run, meaning just a pipeline coming in, a natural gas pipeline coming in is not considered to be a reliable source. It has to be an on-site source. And that, that large amount of gas storage to run the fuel cell for the minimum code runtime or however long they voluntarily want to go can be a deal breaker. If we have a fire pump on the project, case of point, that's eight hours. Be a lot of gas storage on site. Absolutely not impossible, but a lot of owners just look at it and say, eh, yeah, I'd really rather run the fuel cells as a non-emergency backup source. It's just a baseline power. And then I don't have to worry about using it for code. And then I throw in a small generator, whatever the minimum size is. They can also be used, but the other consideration is that depending on the technology, they don't ramp up and down their production as fast as generators do, uh, diesel generators do. And so there, that is another particular advantage of diesel generators, fuel cells. They, they can ramp, but it's slower and it, it, they tend to be used, best used as more of a baseline production for like cogen um, or uh, utilizing biogas, for example, to reduce emissions. That's a good thing. So could you speak specifically, what is the emergency load stuff that you just can't possibly do with a battery because of some code policy thing? Because this is actually from the community, but I'm not from here, so. Gotcha, yeah, no worries. Um, the, the, first of all, all loads theoretically can be backed up by a battery. So I'm trying to I want to make sure I'm not just speaking on any of this, but um, it's just that there are loads that are not well suited to backing up on a battery at all. And those tend to be large motors. Oh, so large motor and the big three that are always, that always kind of come in my mind is like, if our project has any one of these, we, might likely be looking at a, gen a diesel generator. They are fire pumps, elevators, and smoke control fans. There might be some other emergency backup loads. If we're talking like a hospital or something, then we could be talking about all kinds of uh, fans for environmental control and things like that. But let's say an office building. Um, there are some exceptions. There are some, we're seeing actually more projects where UPS systems, battery backup systems are being used for some elevators. As long as we're not talking about, you know, high rise hundred horsepower elevators. If we're talking, you know, 30 horsepower or something like that, it, we've seen some projects go that direction. So yeah. yeah. Um, our, our living building actually does that. Oh, there you go. Perfect example. Yeah. So yeah. it can be done. You're just you just have to size the system correctly to handle the inrush current of those motors, and that can sometimes it just when you see it pan out on paper and say how much room do I need? I need three times as much room for the batteries as I would have for the generator. That's when you start to question why don't I just go for the more um, 
this the solution that works better for voters. And I would say kind of what we were talking about with the code piece of it, it's more about having the systems mixed. So our living building as the example, our elevator is on battery, our emergency lighting is on battery, our fire alarm is on battery. But those are all on UL listed for those systems, dedicated isolated batteries. Where we run into problems is that when we have our battery, and if we're going to use it for our normal backup, for our grid interactive backup, for our peak shaving, you know, backup, and all those systems, and you go in HJ and say, we got a battery, but we're going to charge and discharge this every day. And they go, you're going to do what now? <laughs> um, and so it's keeping the system separate. So it's all batteries. So in our living building, we don't have a generator. And I will say that's a case where not having a generator was awesome because again, we are like lot time, lot land, like exhaust and the this and it was just like going to be a nightmare. So we did all batteries for living building and sustainability reasons. It also was like awesome from a design standpoint. It really simplified a lot of things. So we have the fire alarm has integral battery backup. UL listed and rated for fire alarm. We have a UL listed egress, you know, battery inverter. That's for our egress life safety lighting. We have a battery that is the dedicated for our egress elevator. And then we have our battery that's our PV connected and our grid interactive and does all that stuff as well. It, it sounds like it's really complicated, but actually by by really piecing these out and saying this is dedicated to this system and this is dedicated to that, that system, you're actually reducing the, the complications yeah. because otherwise you'd be managing so many sources with so many uh, needs in the building, some of which are absolutely code required, some of which are kind of, you know, under certain situations. Yeah. And then you have to leave room for your load shedding on top of it because yeah, you it, it, it can actually be better to just say yeah. it's okay if we have multiple approaches on site. It, it's not always best to say we're, we, we're just gonna put everything on one battery system. This project here, the one that has, has generator battery PV, the generator is the life safety backup as well. There's a lot of ATSs on this project. We have no ATSs on our living building. And so that it sounds like, oh my gosh, we just paid for a whole bunch of batteries. That simplification of the one lane and the eliminating automatic transfer switches and all of that, it, it isn't necessarily harder to do it. And it keeps it just a lot cleaner in the discussions with the HJs. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks. We have more. Sorry, there was one more in the back. Okay. Point out there, but when talking about grid interactive building, have you all seen how close we are to vehicle responsibility? Like vehicles are related to vehicle maintenance. I'm sorry, to oh, vehicle, uh, the, oh. yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, well, it's, yeah, sorry, I've been in this industry for 15 almost 20 years, and it's been two years away for my entire career. Um, uh, it, again, I would put it in the category of it's coming. It's in terms of like, we have um, a large DOE project that we're gonna be working on, looking at doing uh, vehicles to building with, with like buses and things like that. Um, and it's, I, my, my early microgrid designer, I'm pretty sure it's like giving him heart palpitations because <laughs> it's, it's very emerging. Obviously there's a lot of kind of buzz right now in sort of the consumer market around it. Or everybody's gonna have vehicles to building trucks and stuff soon. Um, I do think it's, I do actually think it's coming, but I, again, that's another one where it's like, it's not quite here, like quite yet, but yeah. very close. <laughs> I, think, I think it's coming this time for real. <laughs> and maybe just to be clear with everyone on what that is, we're talking okay. using the electric vehicles in a building and all the chargers as an energy source, potentially, right? That, that, that sort of is the battery system for the building, or maybe it supplements the battery system so that you could actually pull power back out of the cars when you need it. it. It kind of makes sense from a theoretical standpoint that you know, you've know you got this huge source of batteries right there that people are driving in and plugging in anyway. Why not use that as part of the building? But obviously it involves a lot of other questions like, is my car gonna be ready to drive home at the end of the day? It's, yeah, all my yeah. power was taken out. But um, it's a really, yeah, I agree. It's a really interesting idea. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if we're doing that, but uh, to my knowledge, I don't think we've had any projects that we've had that haven't actually 
gone so far as to take power out of cars. It's, I would say there's a couple projects kind of around the country, but they're all pilot projects. It is one that it's going to rely a lot on the manufacturers, the controls of it have to be a package system that gets into warranty questions of is that if you're charging and discharging every day, but your warranty was for this, right? Um, so I there the momentum that's developing around it now is is at a level that I had never I've never seen before. So that's why I do feel that it is it is coming for real this time. But um yeah, I would still consider that an emerging technology. So good question. Uh, I think that's good. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right.